Okay, let's begin. So the first question that we'll try today is to find four different models of the theory of dense linear orders where any pair is not elementarily equivalent. Dense linear orders everybody understands? Yeah, between any two distinct elements, there is a third element. Okay. So can you give me at least one example of a dense linear order first? Rational numbers, any other example? Real numbers, any other example? Irrational numbers also satisfy the same property. Any other example? See, if you are given a, a dense linear order, then any interval in that dense linear order is also a dense linear order. So, some examples of intervals, open 0, 1, okay, so open 0, 1 in R, okay, then something else. Yes, so this one, then similarly this one and similarly close 0, 1. Okay, so now look at all four of them. Can you tell me if these are elementarily equivalent or not? They are not. Why? One has a least element which can be expressed as a first order sentence whereas the other one does not have a least element and you can similarly distinguish between all four of them okay so any pair is not elementarily equivalent now the question is can you do it with five models instead of four Five models, so if I just talk about rational numbers, then where should I put rational numbers? Is it elementarily equivalent to one of them? First one, can you prove that? It is unbounded and the theory of unbounded dense linear orders is complete. Similarly, the theory of bounded below only dense linear orders is complete and the theory of bounded on both sides is also complete. So all these four theories are complete if they have at least two elements. <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so that is must. I cannot say that closed interval 1 comma 1 is a dense uh, dense linear order which is bounded and it is of model of that theory, no. Yeah, because there is nothing to check there. Yeah, so we do not want singletons. We want that there are at least two elements. Okay, so similarly rational numbers are here. They are elementarily equivalent to this and in fact every single dense linear order which has at least two elements because if it has two elements then how many elements does it have? Infinitely many. Okay, so all infinite dense linear orders they are elementarily equivalent to one of these four. Okay, so you cannot repeat the same exercise with five elements. Any questions? Okay, so let let us go to the next question. Suppose gamma is a complete theory and has a model of size n, cardinality n, where n is some fixed number. Then can you prove that each model of gamma has cardinality n? How do you express that some, some uh, universe, some set has cardinality n? It has at least n elements and it does not have at least n, n plus 1 elements. Okay. 
So once you know how to express that, then so let sigma bigger equal n denote the sentence uh, which states that we have done this in the last tutorial, yeah, which states that there are at least n elements. Does anybody remember the sentence itself? <coughs> there exist w1, w2 up to wn such that none of them are equal. This is a finite conjunction, so we just write this. Okay. So, let sigma n be the sentence and this sentence I am writing in any language, yeah, because I just need equality, I do not need anything else. So, because the language of sets, L sets is contained inside any other language, this sentence is a valid sentence in every language. So, let sigma n be the sentence that sigma is bigger equal n and sigma is bigger equal n plus 1 is not true. Okay. Once we have that then since gamma is complete, what can we say? And uh, and there is some model m of gamma such that m satisfies sigma n. Yeah, we must have. So this is a model. Well, wh what did we say last time? That if you have a model of a complete theory, then what is the theory of that model? That is equal to the deductive closure of gamma. So, then gamma bar is equal to theory of M, where gamma bar is the set of all those sentences in an appropriate language such that this happens. So, all these sentences in gamma bar are true in M and conversely every sentence true in M is also in gamma bar. So, in particular, see, M satisfies sigma n because it has exactly n elements. So, therefore, theta, uh, sorry, sigma n belongs to gamma bar. Okay, so, now gamma has decided that sigma n is true, it is a logical consequence. So, simultaneously, Gamma, uh, gamma has made a choice that negation sigma n is not true. Therefore, for every model, now you, you understand? Yeah, so uh, i.e. gamma has sigma n as a logical consequence. This is simply the definition of gamma bar. Once we have this, therefore, every model, <coughs> therefore, if m dash is a model of gamma, then m dash satisfies sigma n i e cardinality of m dash is n. Okay, it is a very simple exercise. Any questions? Okay, let us do another simple exercise. Yeah, this is a standard application of the compactness theorem. 
Okay. So, uh, what we are trying to say here, yeah, that if a theory gamma means it's satisfiable if it has models of arbitrarily large finite cardinalities. So, uh, sorry, this one I should make clear arbitrarily large finite cardinalities, then show that gamma has an infinite model. Now, first of all, tell me what is the meaning of arbitrarily large finite cardinality? For every n in belongs to n, there is a model of that cardinality. No, that is not true. That is not true. Arbitrarily large cardinalities only means that there is a model of cardinality at least n for every n. So, for every n, there is a model of cardinality. So, uh, for each n in omega n bigger than uh, 0, there is a model m of cardinality, oh, mo model of something, yeah, I have to first say, model of gamma such that cardinality of m is bigger equal n. This is what the hypothesis means. It does not mean that for every cardinality there is a model. Yeah, that is wrong. So, the, do you remember the statement that we said earlier uh, when we started with predicate logic? Euclid's theorem on infinitude of primes. Yeah, it says that for every natural number, there is a bigger natural number, bigger equal natural number, which is a prime number. Yeah, that is infinitude of primes. So, there are arbitrarily large primes. Similarly, here we are saying there are arbitrarily large cardinalities of models of gamma. Okay? So, that is our uh, hypothesis. Now, we want to show that there is an infinite model and we had to use compactness. Tell me some ideas. <coughs> if we are given gamma, yeah, and sigma bigger equal n we just wrote down, right. So, uh, let gamma prime be defined as gamma union sigma bigger equal n, where n is bigger equal 1. Okay. So, what will be the cardinality of any model of gamma prime if it is satisfiable? Sigma bigger equal n says that it has at least n elements, but we are putting all sigma bigger equal n's. So, therefore, so if gamma prime is satisfiable, then any m prime modeling gamma prime will have cardinality. infinity, yeah, at least L F naught. Okay. So, therefore, what is our claim? Gamma prime is satisfiable, but thanks to compactness, we do not actually have to check for satisfiability. We have to check for finite satisfiability. So, so, we will show that gamma prime is finitely satisfiable. Okay. 
ok how do we show something like this we take any finite subset so let gamma naught be a finite subset of gamma prime then gamma naught contains only finitely many sentences of the form sigma bigger equal n. So, let us let n be the largest uh, natural number such that sigma bigger equal n belongs to gamma naught. Okay. Then what can you say about gamma naught? It is contained inside the set gamma union singleton sigma bigger equal n. Yeah, I put back all the things which were in gamma. Now, this is not a finite set, not necessarily a finite set because we do not know anything about gamma, whether it is finite or not. Okay, but gamma naught is contained inside this and what will be a model of the right hand side? It will be a model of gamma which has size at least capital N and that we know. Yes, so by hypothesis, gamma union sigma bigger equal n is satisfiable and hence so is gamma naught. Now, since gamma naught was arbitrary finite subset, is arbitrary is an arbitrary finite subset gamma prime gamma prime is finitely satisfiable and we are done so usual applications of the compactness theorem which do not involve adding new constant symbols to your language yeah then everything just works fine yeah, it's a very simple application this is even simpler than the coloring problem or yeah uh, what else did we do konig's lemma yeah this is simpler than that yeah you just need to know that there are arbitrarily large finite models so actually this is a very uh, i mean this statement and this statement yeah so here if gamma is complete and has a model of size n then in fact every single model of gamma is the same up to isomorphism yeah so this is known as absolute categoricity but a very interesting consequence of the compactness theorem is that if you have a theory which has at least one infinite model, okay, if there is a theory with at least one infinite model or arbitrarily large finite models by this statement that we just proved, then it has an infinite model of any given cardinality okay a very very strong statement these statements we'll see next time in, uh, in the next week these are called leeuwenheim's kolem theorems okay it's a very strong consequence of this so for example you know that there is a dense linear order which is rational numbers okay so, what is the cardinality of rational numbers? Aleph naught. But now you ask the question, do I know if there is a, a, 
a dense linear order that is unbounded on both sides and has cardinality 2 to the aleph naught. So, for example, you do not know about real numbers. Yeah, then Leuenheim's Kolem theorem says yes, there is a model of cardinality 2 to the aleph naught. Then you can also ask it for aleph omega, some cardinal number that you do not necessarily understand. But Leuenheim's Kolem guarantees that it does exist. Similarly, you can also get models, if you know existence of models of a large infinite cardinality, then you can guarantee the existence of models of slightly lower infinite cardinalities. Yeah, so, all these statements will be made precise later on. Okay, so, uh, we have talked a bit about, I mean we have defined the product structure. Yeah, so, just to give you a feel of product structures, I have asked a very simple question here. So, 2 less than, what is the ordering on 2? What are the elements of 2 first of all? 0 and 1, okay. And 3 is 0 and 1 and 2. The ordering is the usual ordering. And now we are supposed to show that, uh, I mean, for first of all, find out the universe of this product structure. How many elements will the universe have? Six, Six elements. And how are they arranged in the form of a Hasse diagram? In what form? Can somebody draw it on their notebooks and show it to me? Raise your paper. Of course, people who are busy with their phones should continue to do so. Yeah? They are just here for attendance. Yes. Very good. Please draw it. This is very simple structure. Yes, if you don't number them, then <laughs> 0, 2 appears at the bottom. Oh, wait, I have numbered them differently. Ah, you should call them 0, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 2. Yeah, so this will be 0, 0, 0, 0 yes. Mm -hmm. That will be 1, comma 0, mm -hmm. 0, comma 1, 1, comma 1, 1, comma 2, correct, 0, comma 2, okay. Now, we still have to understand a bit about what this structure is trying to tell us. What is the language here? L odd. Okay. So, in the product structure, what happens? A1, comma B1 is less equal A2, comma B2 if and only if A1 com is less equal A2 and B1 is less equal B2. Right? So, this is the definition. A1, comma B1 is less equal A2, comma B2 if and only if a1 is less equal A2 and B1 is less equal B2. So, that is precisely what you observe in this. Yeah? So, two coordinates, there is a path between pairs if and only if both coordinates are less equal. Yeah? So, a very simple exercise just to make sure you understand the concept. Fine. Okay. Now, next interesting question. So, uh, we are talking about hyper naturals over here and these are like real hyper naturals. Yeah, I mean real means, I do not mean real numbers, but u is non-principal. 
if u is principal then what will happen star n will be a copy of n itself yeah we saw that yesterday the dictatorship principal ultra filter means that the ultra product which is the average structure it is simply the original structure one of the original structures so star n is uh, a copy of hyper reals and you have to show it is uncountable how do you go about something like this find an injection from find an injection from from a bigger set, from a bigger set. and which bigger set R plus and how do you show that? Like alpha maps to seal of e power alpha in the sequence. Alpha maps to seal of e power alpha in the sequence. Seal. Yeah, like the seal function. Sealing. Yeah, sealing. Haha, uh -huh. sealing of e power alpha in that sequence. E to the power alpha n. Alpha is coming from where? R plus. Alpha is coming from R plus and this function is. Let me write it down. I am not sure I understand what's going on. So, alpha maps to ceiling of okay, uh, e to the power alpha alpha multiplied by n. Huh. This is a function from Wow. Okay, and how will you show something like this? Well, like they all diverge and they diverge. Like eventually every term will be different. So eventually every term will be different, okay. So they cannot, like, uh, they cannot agree on any infinite set and every, like, every term and the They do not agree on any infinite set, so therefore everything, okay. So you choose, uh, yeah, for alpha in r plus yeah that's what your claim is this sequence yeah i mean ceiling is i think usually written like this yeah with right okay perhaps i mean uh, we'll have to go into some dynamical systems or uh, things i i mean proving that the equivalence class is always different If alpha is less than beta, then e to the power alpha n will be? Like ceiling of e power beta n will always be greater than ceiling of e power alpha n for large If alpha, alpha is less than beta, then ceiling of e to the power alpha n is? Less than. Strictly less than e to the power beta n uh, eventually. Eventually. Yeah? Okay. Okay, I had a, an alternate solution and which is v much simpler. Yeah. So, because we are talking about an ultra filter U on the set of natural numbers, so either evens or odds will be in U. So, without, so either evens, either 2n or 2n plus 1, 2n minus 1. 1 perhaps yeah 2n minus 1 which is all the things which can be written of no 2n plus 1 is better um, or written like this is in u so if uh, without loss of generality assume 2n is in u then what can we can play around with we can always change the entries yeah the equivalence class means that we can always change the entries of entries which are in a small set which means now 2n is large so even if you change the odd entry they will lie in the same equivalence class two sequences will lie in the same equivalence class so i'm going to simply claim that and therefore, the, the sequences, yeah, I mean given a, okay, maybe I, I should write. So, if f and g 
are functions from natural numbers to two natural uh, twice the natural numbers which means even natural numbers then oh uh, sorry and f prime and g prime are sequences of natural numbers such that f prime restricted to even numbers ah oh wait i sh i should have said something opposite i should say 2n to n yeah so f prime restricted to 2n is f and g prime restricted to 2n is g then f prime is u equivalent to g prime if and only if f is equal to g right because two functions they are equivalent if and only if they agree smaller or larger set no but you don't have to you don't have to you have to show it no you have to show it doesn't agree on every large set and is it on every large set or only one any one i was thinking that these two sets are different so eventually you take all these functions and therefore it will be no you could take an infinite subset of even numbers and then infinite subset of even if numbers they agree that that still be okay okay i was thinking that just because we can make a choice here okay i cannot think of any other solution right now so perhaps have you written this down properly i mean that's all like after that it's obvious like because uh, every element of the mm -hmm. yeah i think that would work yeah write it down properly so this idea doesn't work fine uh shouldn't you say r bigger equal 1 no i it uh, by archimedean property you, this will be large right okay okay so let's try another exercise that an element of a ring is torsion free so just real numbers yeah we do not want to talk about an arbitrary element because you probably don't know rings yeah so element of real numbers is torsion free so uh, let me quickly give you the definition so a in r is torsion free if a to the power n is not equal to 0 for all n in natural numbers okay so no power of it can be equal to zero okay so by which elements of real numbers are torsion free all yeah <laughs> okay which elements of let's say z mod 3z are torsion free or what about integers just integers which elements are torsion free all non zero elements are torsion free very good then z mod n z where n is arbitrary all co prime yeah co prime all except multiples of n multiples of n no multiples of n do not exist in z mod n z the factors of n factors of n 
So if I take 6 and then I take 2, yeah, so z mod 6z and I take 2, the equivalence class of 2, then its power is 4, then 8 and then 16 and will it ever be? All the some root of some root some some number which has same prime factors yeah. as n, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that that one will be like subset of, of its at, prime factors. No, not a subset. As I, I just told you, yeah, you consider z mod six z. Then what will be the square of two? Four. What will be the cube of 2? 8 is 2. Modulo 6 z, 8 is 2. Then power 4 will be 16. But 16 modulo 6 is 4. So it will just uh, move uh, between 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. Yeah? Nothing else can happen. For each prime factor, at least one element x. If, if it exists, then it becomes 0. Yes, so all prime factors have to be present as factors of that entry, then it can happen, okay, fine. Uh, I mean that, that was just a, a brief introduction to torsion elements, yeah, and another, uh, yeah. So do you know that circle is also a group? Yeah, circle also has like you consider circle with respect to multiplication, then it has torsion elements. Circle as in complex plane circle, yeah, unit radius, complex numbers. So which of them will give you zero? I mean zero is one there. Yeah, I mean uh, I'm talking about slightly different concept here, but yes, right, okay. Uh, anyway, let us come back to this. The question is now, can you express this in a single sentence that it is torsion free? Is the concept of torsion free finitely axiomatizable? <coughs> you are saying no. Do you have a proof? No means you cannot think of a way. <laughs> but this is similar to the question that we asked in the last tutorial. Yeah, that is the theory of infinite set sets finitely axiomatizable. You have to st say something about every single natural number. Yeah, so this is not like uh, for all n, yeah, a dot a dot n, yeah, this, this could be some somebody's idea n times, this is not equal to 0. This one is not <laughs> a valid sentence because it involves a quantifier over something which is not the universe. What will be the universe? Our universe is a ring, so real numbers. So we cannot vary that quantifier over natural numbers which is an external object. However, we can add infinitely many sentences of this form. Yeah. So this is not necessarily finitely axiomatizable, it is, but nonetheless it is still axiomatizable. Okay. So we can add uh, a sentence oh I mean uh, perhaps not a sentence but uh, a formula theta n of x which is x dot, I mean now we have to write x dot, yeah, how do we write that? We usually use, I mean our language is that of rings, so it is L ring and we have F, G, C, E, 
okay this is binary binary and then maybe there is an h which is unary then 0 and 0 this one stands for 0 this one stands for 1 plus do, uh, plus dot minus 0 1 yeah these are our notations so we have to write that g of g of and so on finally you will have g of x comma x comma x and dot 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 you come out of it and that is equal to c and you put a negation okay so this is the formula um, which expresses that it is not uh, x is not a torsion element of uh, order n and then you have to say that x is not a torsion element of any order n yeah so so uh, how do you write that for all w yeah if w is not zero then theta n of w holds this will say that every non-zero element is torsion free of order n and then you put one such sentence yeah n less than omega now this is a set of sentences so this is our theory of torsion free n can be arbitrary product is occurring n times but the product is of w with itself so why do we need different things how many times that is expressed in theta n? Theta n is the formula which says that you do this n times and, and n is fixed. Yeah, n is not varying. Okay. n is fixed. So, I am adding one sentence of this type for each n. So, I am not just talking about a single sentence. I am talking about an infinite collection of sentences and this collection does express what I need. Yeah, so, this is the theory of torsion free elements and we are excluding the obvious thing. 0 is always torsion of every order. So, why should we bother adding it anyway? Yeah, so, every element is torsion free. You can express it in terms of infinitely many sentences, but this is not finitely axiomatizable. Yeah, maybe let us spend some time talking about 8, because perhaps that is the most difficult thing out of this. So, perhaps we are talking about show that the interpretation of a relation symbol in an ultra product is well defined. Okay, how did we define this? I am not doing the function symbol part, I am just doing the relation symbol part. How did we define this relation symbol? We said that given H1, H2 up to HM, yeah, uh, in our universe, no, not, not in the universe, I, I do not think I need this, just the product structure and an M array relation symbol are what do we say that the equivalence classes 
of all these elements La, uh, this tuple of equivalence classes of these choice functions lies in the interpretation of the relation symbol in the ultra product if and only if I mean this is just definition so if and only if what can we say this set of those indices where the ith component structure satisfies oh sorry uh, I mean this is same as satisfies but h1 i up to h n i yeah this belongs to the interpretation of the same relation symbol in the constituent structure m i is a large set. Okay, so, tell me how to show that this is well defined, what is the meaning of being well defined? If I choose like this is a tuple of equivalence classes of choice functions. So, if h1 is u equivalent to h1 prime, h2 is u equivalent to h2 prime and so on, hm is u equivalent to hm prime, then we need that the set of indices where h1 i dot 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 h n i h m i so this is m sorry h m i this tuple belongs to r uh, the interpretation r m i belongs to u if and only if the same a similar set for h 1 i h 1 dash i up to h m dash i this belongs to r m i this is large. So, how do we show something like this that this is in this is large if and only if the other one is large. Exactly, both sets contain something common, what is that common thing? Yes, so both of them should happen, yeah, so the set, so enough to show that the set of all indices such that both of them belong, yeah, h1 i comma h m i as well as h1 prime i up to h m prime i, they are both in r m i is in u. Okay? But this particular set cons contains what? The set of all those indices where h 1 i is equal to h, h 1 prime i, correct? intersection the set of all indices where h 2 i is equal to h 2 prime i and so on. Finally, the set of all indices where h m i is equal to h m prime i. Whenever for a particular index h 1 and h 1 prime agree, h 2 and h 2 prime agree, all of them agree then obviously this and that will both belong to sim the, it simultaneously and this one we already know by definition because they are u equivalent. So, each one of them belongs to u and therefore ultimately the intersection of all of them belongs to u and therefore 
everything follows by upper bounds, uh, upward close property. Any questions? Similarly, you show it for function symbols and constant symbols. Now, here, uh, I mean, please observe something that our relation symbols are finitary and that property is being heavily used here. Similarly, our function symbols are also finitary. That is also being used because ultra filters are only closed under finite intersections and not arbitrary intersections. You understand? Yeah, so that is why compactness theorem which is a consequence of Wash's theorem, it holds for finitary logic but not for infinitary logic. Yeah, lots of things go wrong if your logic is infinitary. So, let us end it here. A big thank you to all the in-class students as well as online learners. I hope that you enjoyed this journey through set theory and logic with me and the course has taught you a few new things. Thanks again.